Hello, and welcome to North Shore Fellowship's online service. We are glad that you are here. You can click the share button or share the link if you're watching on YouTube so that your friends can join in with us. But in any case, we really are glad that you're here. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that spring is breaking and the birds are singing and new things are on the horizon. Father, we pray that this next season of life is filled with your blessing and your leading so that we can be a blessing to the people that we meet. Father, we ask your blessing over today's service, that you might open our ears to hear your word today and that you might receive our worship. Father, help us to settle in and focus on what you have for us in this short time. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship.
Friends, we're continuing our series, Being the Church. We're looking at 1 Corinthians to see how we're supposed to be, how Paul was addressing a church that he planted with a lot of commands, a lot of advice, a lot of directives, and the Word of God. And so as we apply 1 Corinthians to us, we get a chance to see what it's like to be a church that honors God, that pleases Him, and that conforms to His Word. So we're going to dig back in. Uh, we're going to go into chapter 9 today, but before we do, let's just take a quick look back at chapter 8. And in chapter 8 was the chapter about meat that was sacrificed to idols. In Corinth, this city, there was a lot of idol worship and a lot of sacrifices. And so they would take things like cows and other animals and sacrifice them to idols. And then once they were sacrificed and slaughtered, that meat would end up on the market. Sometimes as, you know, prime steaks on the market. And the church had a problem with it because some of them were formerly idol worshipers. And the idea of going to the market and buying some prime rib and taking it home and cooking it and eating it as Christians, it seemed to really bother some people. And so this was one of the many issues in the church in chapter 8. And so Paul puts forth in 1 Corinthians 8, 9, Be careful, however, that, you, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. Now, basically this, what we eat and drink or what we don't eat and drink is not necessarily of much concern unless, of course, we eat and drink in excess and we become drunkards or gluttons. But what is of great concern, however, is how it affects our brothers and sisters. Now, that meat sacrificed to idols in Corinth may have showed up at the market, may have been good prime cut steaks and would have been fine for them to eat. But you know what? It bothers some people. Now, Paul actually said, idols are nothing. He says, I, an idol is nothing in all, at all in the world, meaning you don't have to take the idols seriously. But if your brother and sister is greatly disturbed by you eating that particular meat, then it should be avoided. In fact, in, in verse 13, he says, therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I'll never eat meat again so that I won't, I won't cause them to fall. And the idea is that we're not just living for ourselves. We're part of the body of Christ and we're living for each other. Everything we do and say has an effect on someone else. Now, as we move into chapter 9, Paul continues this theme and he explains that we have the right to do many things, but a life that's surrendered to the Lord for his purposes is not characterized by claiming our rights. It's characterized by surrendering those rights to the Lord for the sake of others and for the sake of the gospel. So let's move into 1 Corinthians 9, starting with verse 1. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Even though I may not be an apostle to others, I surely am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who sit in judgment of me. Don't we have the right to food and drink? Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us, as do the other apostles and the Lord's brothers in Cephas? Or is it only I and Barnabas who lack the right to not work for a living? So right off the bat, apparently Paul has some accusers. And what he's saying here is that he's comparing himself and Barnabas to people like Peter and the Lord's brother James. They, Peter and James apparently had wives and they were supported by the church. He and Barnabas, however, uh, comparatively, did not have wives and had to work secular jobs to support himself. It's interesting to note that Barnabas is an apostle. He's considered an apostle here as well as many other places in the Bible. In fact, Barnabas is the one that took Paul along and presented him to the apostles who were afraid of him, but Barnabas had to vouch for him in the very beginning. So Paul and Barnabas are apostles that don't have wives and have to work for a living. Uh, comparing to Peter and James, and this it was James' brother, Jesus' brother, who had the opposite, wives and supported by the church. First Corinthians, okay, we're gonna continue with verse seven. Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat its grapes? Who tends a flock and does not drink the milk? Do I say this merely on human authority? Doesn't the law say the same thing? 
For it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while he is treading out grain. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us because whoever plows and threshes should be able to do so in hopes of sharing some of the harvest. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we all have it as well, the, all the more? But we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Don't you know that those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple and that those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar? In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. But I have not used any of these rights. And I'm not writing this in hope that you do such things for me, for I'd rather die than allow anyone to provide, deprive me of this boast. For when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast since I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge and so not make full use of my rights as a preacher of the gospel. Now he's pointing out here that preachers, particularly like Peter and, and James and others, and pastors, receive their pay, their, their reward from the churches that they plant and they provide leadership for. And Paul is saying, that's fine, but what I choose to do is to elect to not that, to not do that, to forfeit that. And he's pointing out that it's because he doesn't want to be a hired hand. He doesn't want to be just simply discharging the trust that was committed to me. In other words, just doing my job. He's a volunteer. He is working as he calls himself a slave, as someone who just works and doesn't get paid. He's pointing out that he's not employed by anyone to do this. So he is not beholden or obligated to anyone except the Lord. He continues in verse 19. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. Possibles. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law. So as to win those under the law. To those having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law. To the weak I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel that I may share the blessing, share in his blessing. So he's explaining how and why he's doing all of this. And he's saying it's okay. Those that are building churches and growing the churches, they deserve to be paid, but I want to do it voluntarily. I don't want to be bound to anyone's particular agenda. I don't want to be under anyone's direct report, direct uh, direction, in, except for the Lord. And that's why he says, I'll work for no pay, like a slave, just so that I could receive the blessing of what I sow in the gospel. How did he do this? How did he support himself? Well, he did this, incidentally, he did this by working for Asilla, Aquila and Priscilla. This is Aquila and Priscilla, the couple that moved from Rome when Claudius kicked out all the Jews, and they had a tent-making business in Corinth. So Paul found a job. He's got new friends. He's working making tents, and he's preaching the gospel. His goal was to do everything and anything he could just to keep pounding away at preaching the gospel. He said, I've become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. In verse 22, and he gives a list. He says, to the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law. To those not having law, I became like one not having law, so as to win those not having the law. And to the weak, I became like the weak. See, Paul was able to become all things to all people by entering into the communities and to relationships with the people he was trying to reach. In other words, people he's trying to win. He would just enter in to the relationships and the communities of those under the law, to the Jews, to those that were, you know, not having the law, which are the Gentiles. This is how he conducted himself his whole life, not only on this missionary journey, but through his entire life. It's fascinating how he was able to use this method 
of kind of infiltrating different social spheres, spheres and create opportunities to preach the gospel. Every situation he faced. And it, it wasn't that he was a chameleon. It wasn't that he was lying about his identity. But he would use different aspects of his identity to, to advantageously and strategically reach into different people Jew, groups. Like, for instance, he identified himself as a Jew when he's talking to the Jews, as a Roman when he was talking to the Romans, as a Pharisee when he's speaking to Pharisees, as a philosopher when he was in Athens at the Areopagus speaking to philosophers. Well, let me show you where, what I mean. As a Jew when among the Jews, Acts 22.3. He says, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought in, up in this city, I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. In other words, he, he's not a, just a Jew, but a Jew of very fine pedigree. He studied under Gamaliel, the most revered of the rabbit, rabbinical school leaders, and grew up in Jerusalem. That's where he spoke from. And then he turns around in the, you know, the, the same chapter in Acts 22, 27. He says he's a Roman citizen when he's speaking to Roman centurions. The commander went and asked Paul and said, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, he answered. As a Pharisee in Acts 23, the next chapter, when he's standing among the Sanhedrin, which is made of Pharisees and, and Sadducees. In Acts 23, 6, then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and others were Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, my brothers, I am a Pharisee, descended from Pharisee. So he went from a Jew to a Roman to a Pharisee. And then he ends up in, in Athens in Acts 17, and he's speaking to a, a, a gathering of philosophers. Acts 17, 21 says this, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, people of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. In verse 24, he says, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples made by human hands. That's a quote. And then verse 28, he says, for him, in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. You see, he, at this point, he's not just preaching the gospel, that's why he's there, but he's positioning himself as a speaker in the hotbed, the epicenter of philosophy in all of the ancient world in Athens at the Areopagus. And that's what he's doing there. And he's brilliant, brilliantly using quotes. Some of what we just read, he didn't make up. Some of them were just quoting ancient Greek poets or philosophers. Like when he said, for in him we live and move and have our being. Well, he's basically quoting Epimedes, who is a Greek philosopher who lived in the 6th or 7th century. And when he says, we are his offspring, he didn't make that one up either. He's quoting a Greek poet by the name of Aratus, who lived 300 years prior. And it was a famous quote, uh, you know, attributed or directed to Zeus, the lord of the gods, you know, the Greek gods. See, this is a perfect example of Paul being all things to all people. He's using their culture and their scope of understanding to preach the gospel. And he didn't do it just to fit in. He's not just trying to get them to like and accept him. That's not his goal. He did it to preach the gospel in hopes that they would repent and do away with their meaning, meaningless philosophy and do away with these exchange of ideas that were meaningless and godless in hopes that they would receive the wisdom of God and life in the spirit by accepting Jesus as Messiah. That was the goal. That should be our goal too. You know, when we try to fit in with the world, I hope it's not just to fit in with the world so that they like us and leave us alone or don't bother us or invite us to their parties. I hope that it's to change their life completely. I hope that our goal is that by getting in, by finding some common ground and some commonality, that the goal is that they will receive the gospel that will completely transform their life and they'll give up all of the things that we, you know, made connections about. You think Paul wanted to spend the rest of his life speaking to them about, you know, Greek poets and, and philosophers that lived hundreds of years prior? No. He wanted to let them hear what the Spirit was saying to them. So Paul's initial mission when he was commissioned by the leaders of, of the apostles uh, was to go and preach to the Gentiles, non-Jews. And he did this throughout Asia, uh, Asia Minor, Macedonia, 
uh, Greece and all along the way to Rome before he was arrested and, and martyred. And in fact, in Paul's commissioning in the beginning, it's very interesting because he goes to meet in Jerusalem with Peter, James, and John. And he's you know, trying to get affirmation. They're the leaders and he wanted them to give him the right hand of fellowship and commission him. And uh, what's interesting is what was determined there that Paul, you will be the apostle to the Gentiles and Peter, you'll be the apostle to the Jews. But listen to how it works out. And the verse Galatians 2, 6 through 10. And the leaders of the church had nothing to add to what I was set, preaching. By the way, their reputation as great leaders made no difference to me, for God has no favorites. Instead, they saw that God has given me the responsibility of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, just as he had given Peter the responsibility of preaching to the Jews. For the same God who worked through Peter as the apostle to the Jews also worked through me as the apostle to the Gentiles. In fact, James, Peter, and John, who were known as pillars of the church, recognized the gift God had given me, and they accepted Barnabas and me as their co-workers. They encouraged us to keep preaching to the Gentiles while they continued their work with the Jews. And what's interesting is that Paul had an immense ministry to Gentiles, but he also had a very impactful ministry to the Jews. And Peter, who was the, really the leader of the church in Jerusalem that was mostly Jews, um, was the first one to ever preach the gospel to a Gentile. And that's Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. So they both did both. See, even though Paul's mission was to the Gentiles, it did not stop him from preaching the gospel to the Jews as well. In fact, I would say this, that most of the time when he went into the new, a new city, when he went on his missionary journeys and he visited a new city, the first place he started was in the Jewish synagogue preaching to the Jews. Now, we went on from there and obviously preached to the Gentiles, but it seemed like he had Romans 1.16 in mind when he went boldly to preach the gospel. And Romans 1.16, well, he wrote it and it said this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentiles. The plan was for Jesus, for Peter, for Paul, Event, uh, initially, as the church was in its infancy, was to preach the gospel to the Jews and then the Gentiles and then the fulfillment of all the prophecies that everyone in the whole world would receive Jesus as Messiah. But it's, it's just remarkable that throughout his journey, he would always start, Paul would always start with the Jewish synagogues and to see who among them will accept Jesus as the Messiah. And then once that happened, he would just go ahead and and invite the Gentiles to hear the gospel as well, Gentiles being those who were not Jewish. In Cyprus, in Acts 13, 4, it says, two of them, Paul and Barnabas, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. There's more cities like Poseidon, Pisidian, Antioch. From Perga, this is Acts 13, 14 through 15, they went to Pisidian, Antioch on the Sabbath and they entered the synagogue and sat down. In Acts 14, in Iconium. At Iconium, it says, Paul and Barnabas, 14.1, went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. That's Acts 14. Then in Acts 17, in Thessalonica, you know, the Thessalonian church, 17, 1 through 2, when Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a Jewish synagogue. And as is, was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue and he preached there. Same chapter, 10 verses later, in Berea. You remember the Bereans, the studiers, Acts 17, 10. As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, where did they go? They went to the Jewish synagogue. And then in Ephesus, this is Acts 19. This is where Paul is writing 1 Corinthians from. How did that one start? Well, Acts 19.8 says this. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. So he was starting with Jewish synagogues and inviting all to come. And as often was the case, the Gentiles would come as well. In fact, in Corinthians, the very church that he wrote both letters of Corinthians 1 and 2 to, this is how that one started. <laughs> and this is, we find this in Acts, 1, Acts 18, 1 through 6. 
After this, Paul left Athens, remember, with the philosophers, and he went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come to Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and worked for them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching and testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. So he started out just in Jewish ministry in Corinth, but it goes expanded from there because in verse 6 it says, But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protests and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justice, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. These many Corinthians that we just read about here in Acts 18, that's the Corinthian church that Paul's writing to. These are the people, both Jews and Gentiles, Greeks, who received the word of Messiah, because Paul was being all things to all men, all people, in order to win some. You see, Paul gave us a beautiful example of what it means to become all things to all people so that by all possible means, you may save some, which is what he wrote to us. He uses every connection, every bit of influence, every opportunity. He creates opportunities to preach the gospel. And what about us? Each one of us has spheres of influence. We have relationships. We have connections. We have influence. We have opportunities. Are we willing to take those and give them to the Lord for his purposes? Paul was definitely willing. Are we willing to allow our friendships and our reputation to be used to bring people out of darkness and into the marvelous light? This is what it means to become all things to all people by all possible means, that you may save some. This is what we're compelled to do as we preach the gospel. We have to be willing to put our fear of rejection and our feelings of inadequacy or you know, our protection of our reputation. We have to be willing to put that behind us and focus on the prize. What's the prize? The prize is seeing our friends and family come to Jesus. The prize is seeing people who don't know the Lord, who are suffering in darkness, whose eternal destiny is to be absent from God in perdition, in eternal separation from God and punishment, unless they come into faith in Jesus, in relationship with him. And when they do, they receive eternal life. That's the prize. The last part of our chapter, the last three verses says this, Do you not know, and this is 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games does, goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself may not be disqualified from the prize. So important. So important that we have one thing in mind and we're willing to give everything to be all things to all people in order to win some. I have a friend who, Dave, who is one of our worship leaders, who is a very well-known guitar player in the 90s and a very well-known band and, and amongst other bands. And once in a while they do like a reunion tour and they all get together. And sometimes it's at a, a, a rock club, a nightclub, and they're just jamming out with these old rock songs. It has nothing to do with Jesus. But he does it. And he does it for a purpose. And at some point during the night, and I've seen this at a, a New Jersey rock club where he'll just be given the opportunity to share his testimony and to direct people to the gospel. Does he want to go out and be a a Jersey rock and roller in the clubs again? No. But does he want to use all he can to be all things to all people to bring in order to win some? Yes. And so should we. Our commission is to be his witnesses to everyone. Jesus' last words to his disciples before he ascended, do you remember what they were? 
It's Acts 1.8. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. What does that mean? Well, think about it this way. They're spheres of influence. For instance, Jerusalem to the apostles, well, that was their hometown. That means for us, that means our local friends, people that we know, people that know us. Be a witness to them. Second of the four was Judea. Well, that's the, for the apostles, the greater region that they lived in. For us, it's people that we probably don't know, but we have things in common with. Be a witness to them. Third was Samaria. This is people outside the region of the apostles. In their case, people they probably don't even like. In our case, it's for people we don't know and probably have very little in common with. God wants to reach them too. Be a witness to them. And then finally, the ends of the earth. Well, that could be anything. Verse, the King James says, the uttermost parts. And that just means anybody, anywhere. Could even mean people overseas. God wants to use each of us to bring people to him. He'll empower us. He'll equip us. He'll lead us. He'll guide us. All we need to do is be willing to be all things to all people in order to win some. Be willing to make the kingdom of God your priority over everything else in the world. Be willing to make the message of the gospel the most important message that you speak. And be willing, as Paul was, to become all things to all people so that by any possible way, we might save them. And we do this for the sake of the gospel, that we may share in its blessing, and that, may, that we and others around us may win that prize. May God bless you and give you great opportunity to use your influence, your connections, your resources to become all things to all people in hopes that some will be saved. Thank you, Pastor. Warmest welcome to you all, and it is great to be with you all again. Well, got lots of things on the list, kind of as always. Got some reminders for you, too, so let's dig in and see what we have. First up, next Sunday is Daylight Savings. Remember, change your clocks. Spring ahead if you want to be on time. We remind you further that we are asking you to pray for Ukraine. The CMA is partnered to assist our missionaries and local churches in Ukraine during this ongoing military conflict. So if you would like to help them with a donation, you go online to CAMA, C-A-M-A services.org. You can go ahead and have your donation come in that way. There is a spot in there where you can indicate that you attend one of the churches. If you put in North Shore Fellowship, we would love for them to know that we care and that we're helping them out. I want to remind you, too, that our children's ministry assistance position is still open, so we're looking higher. This would be somebody to work with the TOTS and pre-Ks. It would be at the Bellworks building on Sunday for four hours. If you have any questions or you're interested in the position, please contact Melissa at her email address. I want to remind you that every Thursday, 7 p.m. at the Bellworks building, we have a prayer and worship service. We did it for the 40 days of prayer, and now we're continuing it again. Come on out. Great time of worship, of fellowship, but most importantly, as we pray together to the Lord. So that's every Thursday at 7 p.m. Friday. Our new prayer group continues. This is a Zoom prayer group. Uh, it's going to be six weeks in total. It will run until April the 8th. It's 7 p.m. We have the link for you there. And this is going to be a chance to pray for our adult children. They're going to be using Stomy or Martin's book, The Power of Praying for Your Adult Children. So if you'd like to indeed join them, you're more than welcome. If you have adult nieces, nephews, godchildren, you'd like to pray for them, you're still welcome. Come on out and join them. That's every Friday through April the 8th at 7 p.m. Remind you, our midweek service, Worship and the Word, is live, and it's back live again this week, so come on out and enjoy. 7 p.m. It's on Facebook and YouTube Live. It's interactive, so log on, enjoy all that's coming on there, so that's for our midweeks. Look, we have a lot more going on than just that. What you need to do is get on our email list, send your contact information to us at info at comes right to your inbox. Could not be simpler. 
Reminders too for our regular stuff, online Sunday services for our online group, uh, 9 and 10.30 a.m. Facebook and YouTube premiere, in-person services, the early service at 9 in Fairhaven and 11 at the Bellworks building in Homedale. Well, let me take this time to indeed say thank you to all of you who have been just so dependable in the financial support of the mission and work that goes on here at North Shore Fellowship. We invite all of you to come and participate that way. You can find links on our website, our QR code, any number of ways for the donation to come in, but we'd love to have you come along and join us on our journey. Would you pray with me now as we pray for the offering that we'll take today? Dear Heavenly Father, we come into your presence with delight and happiness. Father, we thank you for all that you give and provide. Be with us this day. Father, we offer you this portion back. We ask that you would take it, use it, and multiply it as you see fit. Direct it to go exactly where you want. Make us wise to heed you and indeed do exactly what you have for us. Father, bless us for the work that you have in front of us. We pray all this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, hey, as I went through that list, did you hear something that caught your, your ear, caught your attention? Maybe that you'd like to come out and check out? If you do, I promise you, you won't be disappointed. So, have a terrific week, and may God bless you all. Let the key.
thank you so much for joining us at North Shore Fellowship Online. Yeah, we're so glad that we can gather this way. And I'm so glad that spring is almost here and it's, yeah, the yeah. weather's opening up. Maybe it'll be North Shore Fellowship outside at some mm -hmm. point soon. But we're so glad that we can gather in this way. I hope that you receive from the word. I hope that the Lord's continuing to speak to you. There's so many other resources online. You know, you can go to the website and hear the sermon again. You could see the notes. You can see what else is going on. Most importantly is our purpose is to bring people out of darkness and into the light. And that means if you don't know Jesus, if you've never really fully, 100% committed your life to him, we want to pray for you. We want to bring you into that new relationship with him. So reach out to us in any way and we'd be glad to do, do that. Before we say goodbye, we want to thank you for being with us. Keep in touch with us. Don't forget we have Wednesday worship in the Word. We always meet together as you are right now. But why don't you give it a chance to come out and, and see us face to face if you've not done that before or not done that for a long time. God bless you and have a fantastic week.